today I'm going to confine my talk to the grassland management portion of it and the effects it has on cattle and, and uh, wildlife. Uh, several years ago at the, at the National Cattlemen Meeting in, in Oklahoma, one of the Osage Indians talked about uh, he had inherited this ranch from his father uh, who was a good cattleman and he was a good cattleman and he was one of the directors of the Oklahoma Cattlemen's Association. He said uh, in all the years he had improved his production by 10% by his good animal husbandry practices and his selection process. But when he started doing grassland management, he changed it to, uh, he was able to increase his production by 50% by grassland management. Uh, there, the coastal prairie uh, once contained over 6 million acres and it stretched from Brownsville into Louisiana. Now there's about a half a million acres left of the grassland, uh, the native grassland type vegetative communities. The rest, most of it has been converted to initially over to cropland and then it itself, it wasn't managed or they found out that, you know, cotton and corn and some of those other uh, commodities don't grow too well on sand, so they, they uh, it was abandoned and then it converted itself to common Bermuda. Some, some introduced grasses were planted on the prairie to try to increase production, on, like coastal Bermuda grass is the primary one, and then some of the improved varieties of coastal Bermuda. And uh, they take a lot of fertilizer and a lot of management, and so they, they didn't fertilize them very regularly, and so they converted to common Bermuda grass and Bahia grass. And, and so that's what we have remaining. Now there's, uh, the next, uh, the, the remaining, the, the biggest portion of, the, of what, would, what was once the native coastal prairie is now in what is known as the Goliad Refugial Prairie. And there's about a half a million acres in that area that is uh, still in native, grass, native prairie, that you might say. Uh, it's, owned by, it, it's owned by the large ranching families. It's been in their families for over 150 years. And now it's, uh, there's, um, it's beginning to be fragmented into some, some of the family members breaking it down. So. Uh, Remaining ranches can be uh, divided into two groups. Uh, I guess uh, the light to moderate stocking with continuous grazing, and, and the other one would, and then the other group would be some type of grazing management program. Uh, uh, continuous grazing groups. The major problems with that is, is that when you have continuous grazing, uh, they have large pastures still, which limits the flexibility. Uh, their stocking rate is about 15 to 22 acres per animal unit. Uh, li they have some livestock water distribution problems. Uh, they don't burn. Uh, they burn very infrequently. A and then now we're starting to get some really challenging Wesatch brush problems. Wesatch is, is our ma major problem now uh, in, in the coastal prairie. Uh, over to about uh, Matagorda County, and then it then it switches over to uh, Chinese tallow. But but our problem is Wesatch, and you don't want to you don't want to get Wesatch. You don't want to trade Wesatch for anything. You <laughs> kill it, but as soon as you see it, you kill it. Okay. Uh, most of these uh, ranches that that are managing their grasslands and do some kind of rotational program. Uh, or, or most of the continuous grazing group, rather, that uh, what they 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 have continuous grazing, uh, but they're stocked what would be considered lightly for uh, normal rainfall years. But then we get a year like this when it's when it's droughty, and they're kind of slow to remove the cow numbers. So what they're doing is gradually the better plants are gradually diminishing on the ranch. Uh, livestock water is a major problem. Uh, the livestock water locations or distribution of the grazing is a, is a major problem. Uh, 
uh, cattle eat plants they like best until they're gone. Uh, then they eat what they like second best until it's gone, and then they eat what they like third best until it's gone, and so on down the down the line. Uh, and when they're searching for the number one plant, they they trample the number two plant and the number three plants pretty severely. Uh, and because generally there's not very much of the number one plant, so they look and they, they cover a lot of area looking for it. And their feet are the same size as their mouth. So when they take a step, they trample four bites and eat one. So trampling is a major problem. Uh, and cattle are very selective in their grazing habits. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, cattle have a long-term and a short-term memory. And a long-term uh, memory, they, they remember where the features are, where the water is, where the fences are, where the, uh, where the gates are, where the roads are going, and so forth. Short-term memory is, is only for about eight hours, and it covers where they've grazed within the last eight hours. Well, then they remember, well, there's no grass over here, or there's some pretty good grazing over here, and so forth. But they know, after they've been there a little bit, where the number one plants are and where the number two are and so forth. Uh, research has also shown that about 70% of all grazing occurs within 1,200 feet of water. So, uh, if, if, you have, um, if you have water, like a lot of these branches, the big branches that we have left, a lot of them only, uh, they have water like three miles apart. Well, uh, they'll, cattle will walk ten miles from one water to the next, but they don't graze uniformly in that, in that distance anywhere. What they're doing is, is they graze, they'll walk uh, on that, they'll walk from one water to the other, but they're going to be grazing within about 1,200 feet. If you have uh, a 1,500 acre pasture uh, and the water is three miles apart, you can draw a, a circle around the water with about a 1,200 foot radius uh, circle around the water and that will turn out to be about 125 acres if they're going to get great 70 percent of the time and, this, and the rest of this area in here uh, they're not going to utilize it very much, 30% at the very most, and it, it's less than that as you get farther and farther away from water. So water distribution is a major problem. Uh, Aldo Leopold, known as the father of wildlife habitat management, once said, why does silphium disappear from grazed areas? I once saw a farmer turn his cows into a virgin prairie meadow previously used only sporadically for mowing wild hay. Cows cropped the silphium to the ground before any other plant was visibly eaten at all. One can imagine that the buffalo once had the same preference for silphium, but he suffered no fences to confine his nibblings all summer long to one meadow. In short, the buffalo's pasturing was discontinuous and therefore tolerable to silphium. Uh, this can, you, can we turn off that light just a little bit? I think you can see these plants better. Yeah. Uh, that's silphium growing out uh, in one of the pastures. Uh, here, here's another plant of it. Uh, next. And, and this, is, this is where we find it most of the time. This, this, is, this highway out here is the Refurio Goliad Highway. Uh, and you can see the silphium here. Uh, there's some there, there's some back in here, and some over here. It's just all along here, along the roadside, and here's the fence. And which side of the fence is it on? That, that's how you determine, uh, you know, how, how valuable that plant is. If it grows outside the fence only, well, probably pretty highly valuable. Uh, a lot of ranchers mentioned to me that, well, I just open all the gates and let the, let the cows Go where they, they know where they want to go and so forth. And, and I would suggest that a cow is a pretty dumb animal. 
and, and if you're letting them make a grazing management decision, you need to do you need to get out of that business. Uh, here here's some steers on one of the ranches down there that's in continuous grazing and, and they have this they have several pastures that these steers can roam through and, and this is at the end of a drought year. Usually it looks pretty good out here, but uh, no, no rest and continuous grazing during a drought is, is, is a bad deal. On the rotational grazing group, uh, their stocking rate is from 8 to 15, and if you remember, the other one was about 15 to 22. So the rotational grazing group, uh, they're stocked considerably heavier, and they have a whole lot more grass at the end of the year. Uh, so. Uh, they have some livestock water distributions, and part of that is, is a problem I had. Um, I, I, when I went to school, we said, well, you, you have a good grazing distribution for three quarters of a mile. Well, so I said, okay, we need our well a, a mile and a half apart. Well, then, then all of that country in between there doesn't get grazed very significantly. So, uh, now we're putting a whole lot more emphasis on it. Uh, another problem is, is uh, on some of these ranches, uh, well, the largest one I work on is about 54,000 acres. The other, some, some of the others, uh, like 30,000 acres. If, you, if you're trying to burn 30,000 acres, we try to burn it on a three-year, we would like to burn it on a three-year frequency. Uh, that means we'd have to burn 10,000 acres a year. We can't, we can't do that, and, and the weather won't let us burn every three years anyway. Well, we, we have two burn seasons, one in the summer and one in the, one in the summer and one in the, in the winter. The summer one uh, uh, is about a three-week period from about the middle of July until the first week in September, and then we start getting some hurricanes or some tropical storms or or weather that it starts raining, but there has to be, in the summertime, if we do any summer burning, it has to be dry enough that we'll be in a burn van. So that possesses some other problems then for some of the county. Now, Goliad and Refurial County allow us to burn. We just give them a burn plan and they'll give us a variance and we can burn regardless of whether it's a burn van or not. Victoria County uh, will not give us a burn ban. Uh, so uh, the only way we can burn in Victoria County is the burn boss has to be a certified burn manager from the state and, and you got to go through the school and then you got a, a one week burn school and some of us have been through that. Uh, we're qualified for that but then you have to have a two million dollar insurance policy and if you're burning for free for some of the ranchers well you really can't afford that two million dollar liability policy uh, as an individual. It's about seventeen hundred dollars, the last I checked. And uh, so I don't have one, uh, but I'm in the Burn Association, and the, the state is working on some fixes for that, so that if you're in a Burn Association, you can burn free on any of the Burn Association member branches, and the Burn Association has insurance, but. But anyway, the, the burning is a problem on trying to get around. And that's the only way, if, if we can't burn, then we can't, we can't control the brush. We set games on us. If we, if when we burn it, we can kill one and two year old seedlings, but we can't anything over three years old. It'll top kill it, but then it'll re sprout. And we're having some really challenging brush problems now with we set. There are two cardinal rules about what you need to follow on grassland management, and, and uh, one of them is proper use. You cannot graze a plant any time uh, over 50% of the above ground biomass of that plant, or else you're going to shut down the root growth. And when you shut down the root growth, everything stops. So, and it'll shut down the root growth for about 17 days. And then the farther you go, the harder you graze it, below that 50%, the longer it, 
the root growth stops. So you, you're in a you're in a problem. So proper use, you, you'll never hurt a plant if you don't graze it below 50 percent. How would you tell what 50 percent of the bud bi round biomass is? How could you do that? If you clipped it off at the ground level and wrapped a rubber band around it and then balance it on your finger, then you would, of uh, the key species now, like little blue stem, for instance, if that was a major plant, where you clip one off that's tall and clip it off at the ground, wrap a rubber band around it and, and balance it on your finger, when it's 50%, well then, because it's going to be heavier at the bottom, so you, it's, you don't go by height, you go by the total volume. And then the other thing is, no, no, no grazing system can compensate for being overstocked. And, and the, the thing that we found in, in this project that I work on, uh, the CPCI uh, project, uh, is that the more rest you give a pasture that then the faster you're going to restore the better plant communities. Um, we have some ranches that have five pastures and, and, and if you're looking for each herd so you, you if you if they're about equal in carrying capacity and you got five of them then you're only in that pasture 20 percent of the time. If you have Three pastures, well then you're in there 33 percent of the time, and if you're on a switchback system or two pastures, well then you're in there 50 percent of the time. Uh, which one of those pastures would, uh, would, would you increase the more desirable plants, do you think? The more pastures you have, the more rest you give it, the faster it's going to recover. We have, when, when I started in 2000 on, on this project, on, on these ranches that we're working on, None of them had any big blue stem, and that's the way I judge the success of pasture. If you if you go by there and you can see big blue stem seed heads in, in the fall, then they're they're resting and they're doing something right because it's so highly palatable that it won't be you won't find it if you're not resting. Uh, there's a saying in ranch ranching circles that most ranchers spend 80% of their time on things that bring in 20% of their income. Uh, and 20% of the time, or 20% of the, or 80% of the time, uh, it, it only brings in 20% of the income, and 20% of the time on something that brings in 80% of the income. And, and where do you think working out a grazing management program would fit in there? How much time should you spend on that? Well, you, you should you should should spend 80% of your time if it's going to bring in 80% of your income, and that's probably about what it does. But nobody does that. Uh, we we encourage them to have a written drought plan, and in a year like this, uh, we say, well, what what are you what are you going to do if you if you get into a drought? Well, I don't know. We'll sell our calves earlier, or win our calves, or do some of these things. Well, you need to you need to write it down and have milestones. When you reach this milestone, if it hadn't rained by by 1st of May, uh, then you're going to do this. And, and you need to write that down. And so, if you make the decision to do those things, then when it, when it gets there, uh, it's not so hard to do. But if you haven't made the decision to do that, you're going to sell, uh, reduce my herd, we're going to sell all the cows 10 years of age or older. Well, if you haven't made that decision, then it's hard to do that. And then you wait too long and then you overgraze. Uh, most ranches uh, in, in, in this area have, have continuous grazing. Uh, um, but when you have continuous grazing, uh, what about what happens to the big blue stem and Indian grass and and, and, and some of the really desirable forbs forbs like like uh, compass plant, Engelmann's daisy, and silphium? And what happens to those? Well, 
this is this is a pasture we did some brush control on, and it's all big blue stem pretty much uh, that you see right here. It's got a lot. It's got a lot of little blue stem in there, uh, and Indian grass and some of the others. But big blue stem is a is a colony type grass. It's not a bunch of grass. It makes a colony, and it if we can get 20% big blue stem in a pasture that we hadn't had any in, uh, then we we have increased the pounds of grass by 2,000 pounds per acre. It's significant. Big blue stem is is the big blue stem. That's the top one. Uh, this is this is Engelman's daisy. Uh, again, you'll never see this in a, in a pasture where you have uh, continuous grazing. That's a close-up of the leaves on Engelman's daisy. <coughs> continuous grazing, even with a light stocking rate, just makes the cows much more selective. And they, they'll uh, look long and hard for some of these better plants that they, that, that they have. The CPCI is a Coastal Prairie Conservation Initiative, and it's a project in the Victoria, Goliad, and Refugio counties area. And it was the it was the area we started to restore the habitat for that water prairie chicken. Uh, I do the ranch planning for that group. Uh, it's a partnership. The CPCI is a partnership of the Fish and Wildlife Service, the NRCS, the Texas Parks and Wildlife, the Nature Conservancy, and then the landowner groups, the GLCI, the Texas and Southwest Cattle Raisers Association. And Victoria Soil and Water Conservation District uh, does all of the administrative work for the project. Uh, we put on a lot of educational workshops. Uh, we have an annual brush control workshop that we put on every year. Uh, and this is a couple of the ranchers that are in the CPCI and the, and the Victoria Soil and Water Conservation District. The one on the left is Bob McCann. And I mean, on the right was Bob McCann, and on the left was Stephen Diebel. And Stephen was supposed to be here today to accept the award for the GLCI, but he, he got in a problem with some of his cattle. The CPCI uh, program encourages the ranchers to develop a, a conservation plan uh, that includes uh, proper use, Grazing management, some program rest uh, each year, uh, brush control, prescribed burning, fencing, water development, and wildlife habitat management. And, and all of them are pretty much in tune with that. Uh, most of the ranchers in this project area that we're, we're talking about here for the coastal prairie, uh, nearly all of them are in, involved with the CPCI, and they're all in the rotational grazing or grazing management. Um, most of their range condition ha has improved from, and it's now in high fare to excellent range condition class, ecological class, uh, and most of them have big blue stem in every pasture, and none of them had any when we started 10 years ago. And I think that's, that, that, only thing that tells me is that uh, it takes rest if you're going to have some of the better plants. Uh, some of the practices, grazing management, uh, and these are going to go pretty fast. Uh, you know, sometimes we move the cattle with horses, uh, sometimes with four wheelers. Uh, this is a uh, utilization cage. We, we put these out when we first started. We put out some of these <coughs> utilization cages, and whenever you move into the pasture, you move the cage, and then you could see how what percentage of the better grass is to put it on. Usually, like this is on little blue stem. We put it on little blue stem when we moved in, and then we could see how much of what percent they're using. Well, we uh, nearly everybody graduated from that to just they could just go out there and look at it and say, well, this is we need to move them. Or, you know. But we don't use those much anymore. Now, it, this is primarily a big blue stem here where these cows are. There's some silver blue stem seed heads sticking up here in the front, but 
if you if you look, um, that's a water trough, and this is big blue stem, and that's less than 50 feet from that water trough. So, and, and that's a lot of big blue stem there. So uh, they're doing something right. Uh, we again, we have a lot of people want to come look and see how the prairies management's going and some of this. And, and this is the TCU ranch management class. They come down every year and spend a week in South Texas. And one day, uh, they were here two weeks ago, one day they spend uh, with us on the prairie here, uh, on this ranch here. And you can see the big blue stem, seed stems. This was not taken this year. We didn't have any seed production this year on anything, hardly because of the drought. But again, uh, grazing management is, is a major, I think it's a major thing that's, that, that ranchers should be involved in. Uh, this is crinkle on. Uh, it's another plant that's just about like Indian grass. Uh, there's some Indian grass in here, uh, but this is crinkle on. A lot of times it's called little Indian grass. It looks a whole lot like it. It's narrower leaves, but it's high quality. Uh, it's eaten just as readily as, as uh, Indian grass too. So. And this is a prod this is a pasture where we did a lot of brush control and uh, roller chopping. Uh, and it turned a really good grass there. There, there. That's that's what you need to shoot for. And these are these are grazed pretty heavy. I mean that that's not you know done and then get out of it. But but if you uh, this is on Bob and Ken's ranch. He uh, received the grazing and excellent management award from. Side of range management, so that, that's what it takes, really. This is one of the ranches in our uh, non-rotational group. The, one of the, some of the big ranches that now this is uh, this is at the end of this drought. It's taken about two weeks ago. There's usually a lot of grass out there, uh, but you can see what happens if you don't ever rest it. There, what, what's going to happen? The better plants are going to be grazed down, and then there's no rest, and so anytime something comes up, it gets eaten pretty much. And this is on a, one of our rotational grazing units here. You can see the cows in the background right there. This is taken this week, the uh, first of this week. Uh, that's primarily little blue stem, but there's quite a bit of big blue stem and a lot of Indian grass in here, too. Uh, prescribed burning, uh, we, we, as I mentioned, we we have a burn plan, and, and uh, we've, we've been burning the last 10 years. Our, our burning has dramatically increased. Uh, burning is, is uh, I know Texas Parks and Wildlife says that's the best single thing you can do for wildlife is to burn your pastures, and I certainly agree with that. Uh, we do a lot of burning. We try to burn, again, we would like to burn on a three-year frequency. What it boils down to is a four-year frequency, and we hadn't reached that goal yet either. Uh, the burning is, is really top kills all these we sats, though, and so they have to start over, and if you burn a, a mesquite, it won't produce beans for two years, and I think the same thing is true with we sats. So, go ahead. The Nature Conservancy, uh, for about the last six years or seven years, has, has provided a, a put a burn unit in the Victoria, and that has immensely accelerated our burning. Uh, if, if we we'll do the fire guards and then and then get get them to come out and burn it, and, and there's a comfort level with with the ranchers now doing that to get the Nature Conservancy to burn, and, and uh, our only problem is now how much longer is that going to last. Uh, but you can see we put a lot of smoke up. Uh, uh, just because we've been doing that for a number of years now, the burning done by private landowners without our help has, has 
increased uh, just about double because they see all this smoke all the time and we advertise a lot about, you know, we're doing a prescribed burn and so forth. Here, here's uh, that, uh, there was a good fire guard there that was put up with a maintainer. Uh, uh, you, you see this, that's the ridge it puts out and we've got, got them trained now not to do that, put the ridge on this side, not on that side because it covers up some grass or partially covers and it gets to smoldering in there and you can't put it out. Plus it's hard to ride a four-wheeler over that ridge all the time. Uh, this is one of the ladies that owns the, this ranch that we're burning right now. Uh, again, that's the Nature Conservancy crew uh, burning it. I, I'm relegated now pretty much when we're burning, when the Nature Conservancy is burning. That's what I like. Uh, because I don't have to do anything really, other than I, I haul the landowners around and we drink coffee and you know, cold drink or whatever. Uh, this is uh, Bob McCann again, some of you know him. He, he's uh, been a big asset in our whole project, but this is one of his pastures we burned in the summer and this is, and this is Kirk back here uh, checking it out. But we, we burned this in, in the summer. And then this is taking about early November, I think, uh, the grass is coming back. But you see how, and this is nearly all little blue stem already that you can recognize here, but uh, the, the cow can, when you put them in there, they can graze that all the way to the ground. So you've got to be careful when you put them back in there because it really is, makes it very powerful. We put in a lot of fencing. Uh, some of the fences, when we put in a fence, we sometimes will cut it off from water, so we have to put, a, put in a, a water supply. Uh, the fences, again, uh, I don't know how many miles of fences we've done. We're going to figure that up one of these days and decide, but, but we put in a lot of fences. Another thing that we're putting in is, is lanes. You can see we put a lane fence on this side of this pasture, and this goes about three miles and connects five pastures. And so when we get ready to rotate our cows, all we do is open open a gate and they and then wherever they are, we open the gate, honk the horn a time or two, and then open another gate where they can go into and don't stand in the gate <laughs> when you honk because boy they will run over you. They will run over you because they want to go to a new pasture. Okay. Uh, this is another lane we put in on another ranch. This one's about four miles long, and, and uh, it connects six pastures to this. But that takes all the labor out of it. You just open the gate, and you don't have to drive them to a pasture that's been rested or something, and they'll start eating on the way. And so this is, this is really, I think it's profitable, even though it's pretty expensive. Uh, water development, when we first started, we put in mostly windmills. Uh, we put in a lot of cisterns and, and troughs. Uh, now we're putting in solar pumps uh, instead of windmills because the maintenance on them is a whole lot cheaper. Uh, those cisterns hold about 14,000 gallons and those 20 foot troughs hold about 4,000 gallons. We put in a lot of pipeline and, and put in at least a couple of waters and, and we should have put in more. But we just thinking that we were, we needed it every three quarters of a mile and so uh, we knew take advantage of the oil companies and they leave these wells, the ranchers make them case it and leave it and then we come back and put a compressor on here and pump that pit. Most of the time the oil companies will dig the pit even for us and so uh, we can get a, get a compressor and pump it a couple of days and fill those troughs up. Uh, again, here's the solar well we put in and a trough and then it overflows into this pit. And those are wonderful for wildlife. Those, everything drinks out of those wildlife ponds. Uh, this is the construction of one of our cisterns. Our cisterns that we put in are six foot tall and 20 foot in diameter. Uh, like I say, they owe about 14,000 gallons. Uh, windmills with the cistern, uh, we put in quite a few of those to start when we started a project. Here's just another pond with a, a well that 
oil companies they have for us. Uh, our biggest problem now is rust control, and our most expensive problem is rust control. Uh, this is a, what we're using to cut a lot of. We hit, this is a this is a hydraulic shear. It clips the tree off. It clips up to about uh, 12 inch diameter trunk. Uh, and then, and then we come by immediately and spray it with a 15% uh, remedy and 85% diesel mix, and we get about if, if they don't miss it, spraying it, we get they'll get 100% kill. But we normally get about 95% kill, and this is the we sats that we looking at now. This this is a, a, called a turbo saw. It's the same principle except it's got a saw. Go to the next one. It's got a saw blade here that's a, it's about 30 inches in diameter and it's about an inch thick and it turns at an incredibly high rate of speed and they just go up and boy it cuts a tree down and nothing flat. Uh, part of our problem now, this was prairie and now it's we satch and mesquite pretty tall and, it, and what we when we started several years ago, on really getting after the brush, we had uh, these are three roller choppers, uh, and that's a V9 that we could pull it in into this tall, thick stuff here, and, and we could we were doing it for about eighteen dollars an acre. Uh, then we had a we have another one that was on, a, was on an OB8, and it, it's three, and they and they're, they will clear a thirty foot. Swath if you if you have it like that. Go ahead. Uh, there it's just you see how thick it is. Um, this is in that pasture where the PCU group group was. Go ahead. Uh, this is that same pasture. But there there they go. Just keep going. Now we're using the Larson. Uh, the only thing we've got left is, is this Larson aerator that you saw a picture of this morning. That's the only thing available to us. We're trying to get somebody with some three choppers to come back that we have successful. That guy was putting out Velpar, and this is what happens when you use Velpar. You kill a area around it about, but the grass will come back the next year, so it, it really okay. This is Steve Williams right here. Uh, he was uh, chief of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, when he was down here looking at our some of the work we were doing, spraying uh, Remedy and Diesel on mesquite. And you spray it all the way around the trunk and you kill it. But if you miss part of the area around the trunk, then it'll, because it kills the cambium layer, and if you miss part of it, well, it doesn't work. Uh, this is a 10-foot PVC pipe, uh, three-quarter inch pipe. And you pull it apart and you put it in the back of your pickup, two five-foot pieces, and you, you, you go 435 feet, and Ten foot, so you got a tenth of an acre. You count how many small plants you're going to cross over, or how many it passes over, and then you you know how many plants you got. And it cost about eight cents per dose of Velpar. Eight cents per eight cents for a five milliliter dose, and so you decide how many milliliters you got of stem space, and you spray that on the ground and it's absorbed through the roots. Now, on most of the big ranches, we have to use an airplane uh, to spray. We spray, we, unfortunately, we don't have anything that's we're real proud of. Um, we, we, use, we were using Grazon P plus D and that didn't do, that. we sat and mesquite both, it didn't didn't recognize that as a killer, so they kept on living. And we paid quite a bit. One of the important things on when you're spraying, a foliar spraying, is you need the soil temperature to be about 75 to degrees. This is a soil thermometer that has a 15 inch stem on it, so you can push it down 12 inches, and you want the soil temperature at 12 inches to be 75 degrees. So that's pretty critical. Uh, here's some Celsium out here in this. So obviously they're resting. Now this is one of our problems that we're going to have this coming this next year. This this was 2010, 
we had record rainfall in 2010. We had in, in Victoria area, uh, we had uh, over 65 inches. And, and uh, this is some more, that same year, this is on a black land side, a clay side, and, and this is uh, sump weed, and it got up. We couldn't even see the weed sack we were trying to kill with this saw. But what happens is, uh, in these drought years like we're having this year, and we got rain at the end of the growing season. In October, late October, early November, we got a rain, and that germinates the weeds that are going to come up next spring. And so when the when it gets soil temperature gets right and the moisture is right, those weeds are going to be up about a foot high before the grass ever starts, and then they get they they'll be tall and above the grass, and, and you have a real problem. The grass has a real problem then. The weeds get so thick that, that they, there's no sunlight yet for, for grass production. And so we, in 2010, we sprayed one ranch, uh, got them to spray in strips with just weed killer, 2,4-D, and they'd spray a strip and leave a strip, and then we'd get enough drift to pretty much control the weeds on the next strip, and that cost us, well, it cost $9 an acre to spray it solid, and if you cut it in half like we were doing, it's four and a half an acre. So we did that on this ranch, and we increased our range condition class 25%. In other words, our ecological condition went from fair to good, and that's that's a benefit that you can carry on for, I mean, as long as you don't ever graze it, then that's a, a benefit. So we're going to do a bunch of that this year because we had, we've had a terrible drought. The grass is in a weakened state, and we're going to get, and we had rainfall in 1st of November. We had about five inches. So all of the weeds that were going to come up next year, they're, they're germinating. And so next year, you better be ready. So we're gonna we're gonna spray as much as we can. Wildlife habitat. This is an Atwater spray chicken that we released on one of the ranches down there. We've rent, we've actually released them on two. This is an acclimation pen that we put them in when we get them from the Houston Zoo or from the uh, fossil rim. fossil rim. We get we get all of ours from fossil rim or, or the Houston. We get most of ours from the Houston Zoo but we get a big portion of them also from fossil land. Uh, this is Mike uh, Morrow, the biologist for the Fish and Wildlife Service, a prairie chicken biologist, and, and they bring the, the chicks down and we put them in these pens and they dust them with some dust and check the radios. We all of them have radios on them and so forth. This is our, uh, one of our monitoring trucks that has a that we can find the birds with. We, we track them pretty much daily for a while after we've released them. And the Nature Conservancy is kind of taking the lead in doing that for us. Now this is our main wildlife species that the ranchers are concerned about. Quail. Uh, they won't, you can do anything pretty much so long as you don't interfere with quail production. We want, we want to in, improve the quail situation. Well we're we're doing some quail cock call counts now in the spring to see what kind of distribution we have, and then we, we're doing some fixing to start on some covey counts that we'll get some determine actually some population. But the interesting thing, uh, the, the higher the ecological condition of a pasture, in other words, if you get these really thick, big blue stem in there, we have more quail in those pastures than anywhere else. And, and all, of, all of the ranchers have decided, boy, that's, that works for quail management. And, and a lot of the experts come in and say, well, you you can't have any quail in here. It's too thick. Well, I guess one thing I can think of, the quail can't read, didn't read the manual, <laughs> but they, they're obviously they're really thick out on the, these ranches that are in our project. That's the best quail hunting in Victoria, Goliad, or Furio are those ranches that have grazing management programs and they're, they're 
ecological, ecological condition is improving. Uh, this is the best quail plant, I think, in my judgment. One of the three very best out there. Uh, this is Catfall Sensitive Briar. It produces seed about three times. It's a legume. Uh, quail eat the seed. The deer and cattle both eat the, the leaves. Uh, the quail eat the leaves. The prairie chickens eat the leaves and the seed. There's another one called uh, yellow Neptunia. I can't tell the difference in them. One of them has a yellow flower, another one has a purple. And they both are sensitive. You touch them and the leaves fold up. And then bundle flower is another one that's the same thing. It's sensitive and you touch it, the leaves fold up. Uh, we get a, thousands of sand hill cranes every year. Uh, we've got a lot of deer on the prairie, uh, although most of the bigger ranches down there, they don't do much with it. I mean, they don't hunt. They, it's family only hunting, and they're mostly interested in quail. <laughs> so we don't need much. We got a lot of turkey, uh, turkey roost on the prairie. Uh, this is a pasture we burned and, and boy, they, uh, in the winter and then in the summer, boy, they, they spend a lot of time out there. This is a burrowing owl. We're seeing a whole bunch more of those. Now, I don't know what the deal is with those, but we're seeing a bunch of them now. Uh, seeing a lot of hogs, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, coyotes. We do a little bit of grassland planting. Uh, uh, with the Victoria Soil Water Conservation District has, owns a Truax grass seed drill. It's a no-till drill. Uh, this is a switchgrass. This is San Antonio River right there, and this is the bottomland area along that we planted. This was wolfweed, and we killed the wolfweed and planted grass there, and that worked out good. Uh, we can plant in a, in a sod. Uh, planting native grass seed, is a, it takes about three years before it can see much results. And so, uh, this is a bale buster. We, we uh, use that. We've tried that. We've harvested the big bales uh, when they're in seed production and then uh, put them in this thing and it throws it out. Put, put it the, next one. Uh, the problem is you don't know what you're putting out, really. Uh, has anybody got any questions? Would you burn your pastures in the middle of a drought like right now? Well, um, the, the problem with the drought is, uh, like all of the ranchers in, in our project, we, we have some pastures we can burn because we got they still have carryover vegetation. But how much longer is it going to last? And are you going to be burning something that you need next month? So, uh, but but our problem with the drought and burning is. We make all these elaborate plans. Well, we're going to burn this pasture and this pasture and this pasture, so we've got to rest them three months. If we're going to do a summer burn, we've got to rest them in the spring three months so we can build up the volume of grass fuel. Or if we're going to burn them in the winter, then we've got to rest them from the summer through the fall growing season to build up enough forage to burn it. Now, if you, were, if you were on some kind of continuous grazing, you'd have to rest them a whole lot longer than that. But these rotational, these ranches that are doing a good rotational program, uh, they just need to rest three months. If we get a normal rainfall, then they'll have to produce enough fuel. And we, we, we say, well, we're going to burn this winter, and so we rest this pasture. And then, and then if we're in a drought, and well, we decide we can't burn it, well, screws up our deal for this year and next year. What are we, we're going to burn this pasture next year. Well, it, well next year we, we need to burn the one we were supposed to burn this year, and, and it just, it's a problem. But uh, that's why they pay us the big bucks. <laughs> After a burn, how long do you have to wait before you graze again? Well, uh, as long as you would remember the 50% rule, the proper use, you can graze at any time, but you can't graze over 50% of it. Now, we normally rest it uh, 60 to 90 days. 
good during growing season. If we burn in the winter time, well, we won't put them cattle in there until uh, after the spring growing season is about 60 days to 90 days old. Some of the ranchers, they say, well, boy, I could, I'm going to be winning my calves. Uh, selling them, I, if I just run them through there in a flash grazer, flash grazer, that's fine as long as they don't graze more than 50% of it. And they, boy, but those calves will gain like, gain like crazy on that. They, they really do wonderfully well on, on newly burned pastures. Some of the ranchers, they say, well, we burned, we burned some pastures in the summer, and then they wintered their first calf heifers on that burn pasture. So we got to do that every year. We got to, we got to plan for that because it reduces the amount of feed, and, it, and the heifers go ahead and gain weight on, on that highly, on highly palatable grass pasture that you burn. They, they really do well on that. So, but you can't do it. Every can't burn it. Well, yeah, we, you can burn somewhere on these big ranches. You can burn somewhere, but uh, you can't. What we, like I say, what we would like to do is burn on a three-year, but every three years we, we'll lose one.